We're excited to continue the conversation about mental health and the first discussion uh, we're going to have is around the topics of anxiety and depression. Um, Now, Kyle, we hear those words thrown around a lot. I think it would be wise just to start by telling us what those are and a little bit about the differences between those two ideas. Yeah, you can't watch a lot of TV without seeing commercials for anxiety and depression. It is probably about as common a human experience mm. as as one can get in our, our current culture. It's uh, almost like breathing. Um, if mm. if you're still up and moving, you all of us at some degree are managing or living with anxiety and depression. That's right at a regular pace of life. Um, it's just kind of in our culture. America is founded on a, a, a that belief that we need the next thing. And mm-hmm. so that in and of itself right. creates, well, I don't have the next thing. And what is the next thing going to be? And can I get it? You know, so it's, mm-hmm. it's like our culture creates this melting pot of anxiety and then depression. There, I, I call them you know, cousins, because they're very, very related, but they look very different. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, and and how they present themselves. So, but they're pretty much in almost every person's everyday experience. You know, when you talk about the the difference between the two, um, anxiety, you can kind of feel that differently because it's it's a fear-based kind of emotion. So we start to, you know, you get all the responses to fear. There's fight, flight, or freeze. Um, And so anxiety can look like I just freeze. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So mm. I go dark. Mm. Um, it can be uh, anxiety. So I'm, I'm fearful. So I bow up. Like I bring, Fight. Yeah. yes, I kind of come to the table. I'm a little more aggressive, a little more assertive. My tone gets a little shorter. And um, that may sound like anger, but it's really anxiety. Mm. And so there's, it's kind of fueling that. Um, and then the, the flight is, they just literally leave. <laughs> they're gone. Yeah. You look around, and you're like, well, wasn't so-and-so just in here? And they're not there. Right. Um, and so it is exactly what it sounds like. But you can pretty much, your anxiety is probably showing up in one of those three ways, but we, we all feel our heart races, our, mm-hmm. our uh, hearing gets better. We pay attention to little things. Sometimes when our anxiety really gets controlled, it's like, you know, those slow-mo movies. It's like we start noticing things in slower motion Mm. because our brain is trying to take in all the information and any perceived threat that might be there. And so that's anxiety is going to really have that fear underlying it at all times. Depression, you flip to the other cousin and it's kind of fueled mainly by anger. There is a sense of, uh, you know, like you see people that are raging, but depression is anger turned inward. Mm. It's kind of that stewing, you know, just kind of soaking in these thoughts that then become oppressive. So it can be, it can be, you know, revenge or being, you know, like taking, um, just kind of sitting in your thoughts of um, just anger, seething, mm. so to speak. Now mm. it can be towards yourself uh, and self-loathing, self-pity, self. It could also be towards some other person that you perceive as the threat or mm. the person who did harm. It just it becomes overwhelming. So anxiety and depression are often. In, in both of us, uh, or both are in us at the same time. Right. That you, so you kind of have to look at how is it being expressed? Like what is coming out of us in that moment? Mm-hmm. And, and is it being driven from this anger turned inward or a fear controlling our behavior? Right. So Right. And um, I appreciate what you started with by saying these are just things we are all dealing with. Every all day. of us are struggling with it. I do think as a pastor, what I've observed, and we've talked offline about this before too, so I know where you stand on this, anxiety does seem to be on the rise, especially among younger people. It seems like that's a, it's an epidemic almost uh, that people are working through. What's your theory on why anxiety particularly is on the rise in our society? Well, I think uh, probably if I had one thing to kind of hook it on, I would say it is the amount of knowledge that we have about other people outside of our circumstances. So the information, because I think anxiety often is rooted in a comparison of ourself to what we perceive other people are having and needing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I'm much older. Back when I was growing up, you just had the people right around you to compare yourself with. Where now, social media, TV, um, just the internet access to all this information causes us to then go and seek out information that we compare ourselves and evaluate what we should be doing, could be doing, ought to be doing, and then 
it becomes like a tsunami of comparisons mm. that, that wash over us. And so that can be what our income level needs to be. Right. Well, how many friends do we need to have? How many likes do we get on that comment? Who's noticing me? Who's not noticing me? Do I even want to be noticed? You know, so it's, there's so many more ways for our self, our perception to be compared by others, because before not every, you didn't have all these opinions coming at you. Well, now you can post something on social media and you can get, you know, right. Susie's opinion. No, Karen. We'll go with Karen. She's the <laughs> proverbial the critic. Culprit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Karen's out there just giving you her two cents worth right away. And it's usually never helpful. Right. You know, there's it's a criticism. So we are vulnerable to quick criticisms because it's everywhere around us. Mm. So we're growing up in a sea of quick critics, quick evaluations, and, and you're judged on that one thing forever. It states that people should bring it back up, you know, like even Facebook. Remember this from seven years ago? Well, you hope it's a good memory, you know, <laughs> uh, but things can be brought up at any given notice and referenced. And so that level of fear has never been felt before by a culture because, you know, like I said, growing up in my days, people didn't have cell phones. They weren't recording everything that we did. Right. And so you didn't, you didn't have to worry about what might be brought back up later. Yeah, I mean, I, I shudder to think about what high school would have been like for me. Yep. Having my entire life out there. <laughs> Recorded. <laughs> yes. And critiqued at any given moment. And, and the immaturity of any inane thought that comes into my head. Yes. Coming out there for all the world yes. to see and for somebody to capture and keep and all those types yep. of things. And it's, then what makes it harder is that, that kids and younger folks, you know, the millennials are growing up with that. And my generation just can't understand it because we didn't feel that way when we were their age. Like, what's wrong with them? Why are they doing this? It doesn't, right. doesn't make sense to us because my cult culture has changed so fast that there hasn't been even like one generation difference from the way this generation was raised mm. to this one. Mm. Now it's a completely different culture, even though you may even be in the same town. Your kids may be growing up in the same school district, right? but it's not the same place. It's a totally different experience. And so the anxiety that they're mm. feeling a lot of times people don't know what, what to do with that. Like, why is this happening? Yeah. And then why are you so anxious? Yeah. Get over it, you know? Yeah. Or yeah. depression sits in when people feel like they just can't. They're, they Because of these comparisons, they get angry because someone said this or did this or shared this. And so that sense of anger turned outward, we see that rage in America going way up. Mm -hmm. I mean, just on a constant. Depression is turned inward. It's that flip side where people are just beating themselves up for decisions or they get hopeless. You know, the Bible talks about hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so when people think there's no way I can get to my goal, there's no way I can ever be like so-and-so. So that depression just comes like a cloud and sits mm -hmm. on top of that person. I really want to come back to the parenting thing because I think that's an incredibly important insight. And we are going to come back to that in another segment, talking about parenting and the challenge of that. Absolutely. I want to zero in, though, just for a second on the person who's watching this, listening to this, that says anxiety is a problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a huge topic, but Kyle, just give us just some basic thoughts about how you'd encourage somebody to cope who says, I am dealing with anxiety in my life. Well, I'm going to say that really some of the things I'm about to tell you would apply to both anxiousness and depression. Okay. Because there are some things that we just need to, to look at, and it kind of, you would then take this concept and move it this way towards anxiety and fear, or move it this way towards anger and understanding. And, and the first thing I would say is, is if someone you know is struggling with anxiety, not you yourself, but someone else, to be with them. You know, to just sit with them. We, we, you know, you get Job's friends. Those were not the good counselors <laughs> of the day. Right. Uh, but they, though, the ones who got it right was he just really wanted someone to, do you hear me? Do you understand me? You don't have to agree with what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give any insight to me. If you can just be with, that would help so much of what our anxieties are driven by. Are people going to like me? Am I going to be successful? Will I be able to do this? Can I handle the pressure? Well, I'm here with you whether you handle it or you don't. Because much of also what's causing the rise of anxiety and depression is, is a overall disconnect in our culture. Mm. Our culture is increasingly disconnected. Even though social media gives us more information, right. it does not increase my connection to you mm. as a human being. I can't look you in the eye on the internet. I can't reach out and put my hand on your shoulder. Right. I, can't, I can't feel your presence. And those are the things that are the biggest impact for anxiety and depression. When I know that this person knows me, sees me, and loves me, 
then that is going to help me hmm. manage my anxiety and depression at whatever level and I And they're going to love me even if I don't measure up, right. pa- make the yes. grade, make the team, yes. measure up to the rest of my right. friends, that mm-hmm. unconditional kind yes. of love. Yes, and there are very few of those people on the planet. That's what I'm saying. We have mm-hmm. to both become that person for other people so right. that we can have them when we need them. Right. And um, another thing to look at is all of our, our underlying thing. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so he is. So when we take a look, we have to look at the thoughts that we're thinking when we're feeling our feelings. So I encourage people to journal for depression or anger. Mm. And it's just free flow. Don't evaluate every thought. Just say, am I really thinking this? Is this really? Because mm-hmm. you don't have to act on everything you think. Right. You don't have to be everything you feel. Mm. But you really can't move one way or another off that until you identify it. Mm. Like you have to then, and the Bible says, take every thought captive and hold it up to the light of Scripture. And so when you can identify that thought, then you can bring it into the counseling room or to your scripture and say, is what I'm thinking rooted in truth? Is it rooted in the correct understanding of God? Or am I distorting who God is or what he says? Because once we understand that, then we can decide, am I going to believe the truth or am I going to believe my thought? Mm -hmm. And so, but until we can capture that thought, you can't really evaluate whether it's true or not. So part of the challenge I'm hearing you say that people that are struggling with anxiety and depression are, are working through is they may not even be aware yes. of what they're thinking. Yes. There's not even a, a kind of a, I'm just kind of in this and I'm not able to get above it. Yeah. One of the things you're trying to do as a counselor is help people sift through those types of yep. things. And see what kind of might be underlying that depression or anxiety. Mm-hmm. You know, like where is the root of it? Because a lot of counselors, uh, non-biblical counselors, would take the approach of let's deal with the symptoms. Here's how you cope with anxiety attacks. Here's how you deal with depressive behavior. You know, you know, do these things. And those are all important things. They are super helpful right. to deal with the symptoms. Right. But they're not going to take the root out. Hmm. So, okay, we can, we can learn. And, and I would say as a biblical counselor, I'm still going to use some of those approaches sure. to help you manage the symptoms of your anxiety. But I always want to make sure that I'm taking you to the root Mm -hmm. and getting the ax there and ripping that out so that it doesn't keep producing. So, you know, again, I would put the analogy of some those strategies help us pluck the flowers of the dandelions, which, okay, that keeps it from spreading. But in two days, you're going to have two more. Yeah, you're going to have two more, four more, six more. You got to get the sucker out and you got to take it out by the root because even if you just whack it off at the surface, you leave the root, more dandelions. Hmm. Same thing. I grew up in Texas with stickers and right. they just multiply Yeah, and they're painful, you know? Right. And so you can just get rid of the pain or you can get rid of the root. And so that's where I think biblical counseling is going to keep moving in and looking at that. And yeah. so, yeah. Well, and I, I just want to come back to something you said a minute ago as we kind of wrap up this little segment. Um, I think it's incredibly important for people to have those types of unconditional loving people you talked Absolutely. about a moment ago. And it's just essential. To, just to connect the dots there from a ministry standpoint, this is why I believe God um, has put such a priority on the church. Uh, mm-hmm. The church is one of the places where we want to connect you to those kinds of relationships. Uh, obviously, that starts with your family. Um, we want to see your family thrive in that way, but I know some of you have come from families where you didn't experience that or you're in families now where you don't know if that's really the case, we want you to know that the church, the body of Christ, is a place where you can find those kinds of connections with people. And at First Baptist Mansfield, one of the reasons we're having this conversation is we do believe those relationships are incredibly healing when they're grace-based, when we're forgiving of one another, loving one another sacrificially uh, the way Christ has loved us. It only makes sense that when we love each other the way Jesus has loved us, it's going to begin to address these things. But I also want to say this as we close. If that's a struggle for you, know that the church is not just a place to find relationships. There are good resources out there like Kyle, like Metroplex Counseling that we want to connect you to. Kyle, thanks for having this discussion. Sure. Sure.